From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, first batch of newcomers step up to the mic. We talk about our takeaways from the first batch of interviews with the transfer class for 2024. The ACC, FSU continuing to lock horns in the legal arena. Corey and I share our thoughts on the latest. And Corey hangs out with Coach Lonnie Alameda. She is the best. Wake Up War Chant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com is the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, physical address. Wednesday's lunch special, as you all know, chicken wings, five of them, five delicious, juicy wings. Can you get all flats, Corey? Is that possible? Can I request five chicken wings on Wednesday for my lunch special with French fries and be like, I want all flats? You can. It's a little bit of an upcharge, okay. but it's worth it, especially if you're a flats man like I am, mm. and apparently you are. Yeah, you know, sometimes... I. The whole argument about do you call them flats or I mean, I just thought you would know, call like drumsticks and then wings. But, right. get, you know, it's flat sounds cooler. So whoever thought about calling them that and it proliferating to becoming as ubiquitous as it is to mm. call them that shout out to you. Well done. I hope I leave a legacy like that at some point. Yeah, It's a great one. Yeah. Uh, but that's Corner Pocket Bar and Grill's lunch special today. Go check them out. They're great. We love the CP. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, cptallybar.com. The website, warchant.com, our parent company, employer. Uh, maybe shareholder, uh, depending on which side of the coin you're on. Uh, Five-star rating and review. Come on, everybody. Come on. Get up. 2024, last day of the month. First month already gone. Can you believe that, Corey? Got, I cannot like believe it. I cannot believe it, buddy. We're we're uh, we're pretty close to wedding day. Yeah. We're, we're marching headlong towards it. Can't wait, man. Um, I might I'm going to start uh, perusing J. Crew and trying to find maybe even a new. I, I've got a couple of suits I've never worn out, so I mean, I'll, I'll definitely have something new. But I'm hmm. maybe there's something else out there that catches my eye. I got, I got, I got to bring it. Clark, yeah. Clark the, the, the Clark wedding man. This is this is the biggest. This is like the Catalina wine mixer of Tallahassee. So uh, if you think I'm not going to upstage you, Corey, but I'm going to come close. Buddy, that's fine. I, the 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 crazier, not even the crazier, the sharper that people dress, the better. I just feel like it. The, the moment deserves it. Okay. All right. That's everything we got out of the way. I think five star rating review, thumbs up, please as well. Uh, Corey's guys interview with Coach Alameda coming up later on the show. But uh, I guess before we get to that, let's talk a little football. People like that. People gave us some guff on YouTube. We're talking about basketball the last episode. Get over it. It was like four minutes, if that. And it was and at the end of the show. It was at the end of the show. Unbelievable, guys. We love oh. you, but come on. You know, we love ham. You got to love ham. How can you not love ham? So mm. uh, I, I don't love ham like the food. I can't eat it. It's pork. But, you know, Leonard Hamilton, you right. know we're talking about everybody. Uh, we spoke to a trio. We're spoke to, supposed to have spoken to a quartet of newcomers. But on Tuesday, we got a trio of newcomers. We got the Alabama duo, which we've got three players from Alabama. We got two of the three. Malik Benson, the wide receiver, who was the number one overall junior college prospect in the 2023 cycle, who committed to Alabama. Played in all the games. Only had about 11 catches, though. But, hey, he's he said it a few times, Corey, uh, that it's, it's his last season. I think he mentioned yeah. it on two different occasions. So he's coming in focus and realizing what he's got to do. He's He's been at a high level program so that that'll help out uh, his teammate tj ferguson i, I guess apparently we're, we're, we were are to refer to him as uh, terrence is on the set uh, of terrence it's tj yeah. yeah it's on the w2 it's on the birth certificate but we'll call him tj uh and then we had Devonte brown uh, mm. florida product of florida american heritage high school pat sertan product played at you actually i don't know if coach sertan was there when he was there but he played at ucf and then miami and now he hears at florida state defensive back he doesn't know Th that's a the most interesting thing in a day that really wasn't that interesting, you know, Corey wasn't there in person to ask questions. So everything falls by the wayside when Corey's not there to right. bring the thunder, hmm. but it, it almost amazes me. Ferguson was asked, you know, like, what's the plan for you? What position do you think you'll play? Same thing with Devonte Brown. Apparently he's got some safety and cornerback experience. Corey, both those guys are like, yeah, I don't know yet. And I know that all gets sorted out at spring. They'll be, they'll tell them to line up at a certain spot, or you're you're in this group during warmups. So it all works itself out. But it's just kind of crazy to me that you're at this level of your career, kind of at the end point of it, and you're going to come to a new place with a new coaching staff, and you might not have something 
I know everything's fluid, but the fact that like you don't know for sure, like this is what I want to do, this is where I'm going to be at, that seems kind of weird to me. But I guess you know you, you trust the coaching staff, and uh, you're, you're going to be open and, and receptive to anything your your first day on the job, if you will, if you're these new guys. Yeah, and I think Ferguson basically is a guard that can play center if they need him to. That's the impression I got from his answer. He's yeah. like, I can play anywhere on the interior, meaning left guard or right guard. But also, he said he also mentioned center. But we know Florida State has its center. So uh, unless Maurice Smith just can't get healthy, um, he's a nice backup option to have. So is Darius Washington, obviously. So I think that's what he meant. But I, I think we know he's coming in as a guard. Uh, the other kid, I, I think it's just like they don't know what they have in him. Um, the the DB from Miami via UCF, um, and they're just gonna see where he what he looks like in the spring, right? No, I, that's the impression I got. Is like we'll line him up at either place. Let's see if he can be uh, a competent safety. Let's see if he be a competent nickel or corner, and then we'll go from there. But I thought uh, but that's wild the, though. I mean, he's played over two thousand snaps in his career, you know, and he played primarily at, at cornerback last year at Miami, like. You figured it's like the Jeremiah Byers thing. Maybe there's that possibility, but it's like, man, this is what this kid has been doing his whole career. Like, why? uh, How would you? It's not a criticism. Again, this is just a a, a slow January day, but that's that was the thing that kind of made me go, huh, huh, a little bit. Don't you think it's more like, you know, I, I think they I don't know if they expect him and I'm not trying to diminish the kid in any way. But out of all the transfers, I think he's the one that, in my opinion, might have the the tallest hill to climb to get serious playing time, especially if he's a cornerback, because you know you know what you, you Cypress and Azaria are locked and loaded. Hmm. But the nickel spot, you know, there's a fight for that. Don't know what they're gonna do with Earl Little. Um he might be a safety, he might be a nickel. We we don't know. Again we'll find this all out I guess in five weeks, six weeks, whenever whenever spring practice starts. We'll see where at least they're starting those guys initially. Um, but Ferguson, I, I liked I liked Benson and Ferguson. By the way, you said they had three. I think they have at least four, right? Because they have the linebacker, oh. they have the running back. Oh, that's five. Yeah, they got Earl Little, they got yeah. Roy Del so Williams, got, and then they got Sean Murphy. Yeah, they five, got five, five dudes from Alabama, which is crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I liked when Ferguson, Ira asked him about um, – not playing a lot at Alabama. And he's like, look, I can promise you, all those guys you saw on Saturday, they weren't winning every rep in practice, uh, which was a really interesting insight into maybe how he thinks. Like, yeah, okay, maybe he wasn't good enough to be on that offensive line starting, but he went up – imagine the guys he went up against the last couple years um, playing at Alabama, being a second-team guy, probably playing those first-team guys a lot in practice and you know he seemed pretty confident in himself saying yeah they didn't win every rep meaning he played pretty well against them and I think um that kind of mindset I, I just I was impressed I mean as impressed as you can be with 15 minute interviews but I was impressed with both of those guys from Alabama because I don't know how often either one of them have talked you know Saban didn't let newcomers talk so I doubt Malik Benson's been in front of microphones and I don't know, man. He grew up in Lansing, Kansas, and played at a JUCO Hutchinson Community College. And he said it that he played at a junior college in the middle of nowhere. And it's like I don't, I, don't, I got to look at Lansing, Kansas. I don't even know where that's at on a map. But he said it. Yeah, yeah. He from middle of nowhere, Kansas, which you know, Lansing, and then Hutchinson. I mean, it's it's pretty remarkable. But um, but yeah, man. I think that's. Uh, I, I I just thought I was impressed with the way both of those guys handled themselves, um, their first time in an, in an environment like that, and kind of the confidence they have in themselves, which you should, right? You were just at Alabama. Like, if Nick Saban offers you a scholarship, even if you don't play for a couple of years, or in Malik Benson's case, you start half the season, you just don't have a lot of production, I feel like you probably feel pretty confident in yourself if Nick Saban or Kirby Smart, guys like that, are offering you scholarships. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, again, I I think the the fact that Benson seems to – embrace or at least you know be very cognizant of the fact that again this is his last season his last go around um and i'm sure man it had to be a bit of an adjustment man had to be a big adjustment going from juco to alabama especially alabama breaking a new coordinator and a pretty you know rudimentary quarterback when it comes to throwing the football i mean heck they really didn't hit their stride until probably what like late october offensively with uh jalen milrow so won't hold it against him, but th- th- he's probably the biggest wild card of the bunch too. I would think in terms of like, if he hits what you would hope would be the, the best case scenario for a guy that was the number one Juco wide receiver in the entire country and was at Alabama and apparently has speed and spades. Like if he's the one guy that can 
I don't like, would it be a Fisk level production, a, a Keon level of production as a transfer that I guess other than DJ, obviously being the quarterback, that's probably the one you put your, most of your chips in. If you're not going to go all in, obviously on the quarterback. Yeah. And it's interesting. We were talking about this on headlines about how this offense, what this offense is going to look like. And it's something obviously guys you are going to hear us talk about for the next eight months, especially during the parts, you know, in the, in March and April, we can watch them on the field. And then in August, we can watch them on the field. You know, last year, as good as the offense was at times, um, there was some deficiencies in a lot of they didn't they didn't hit a lot of big plays down the field. Hmm. Uh, they didn't take a lot of shots. The deep passing game was not part of their offense for a large percent. Like Johnny, Johnny was a pretty big time big play threat in twenty two, and he didn't do a whole lot of that in twenty three. He was a first down getter and very good at it when he was healthy. Keon wasn't healthy the second half of the season, so that element was taken away. And, and also, Jordan, I don't think he threw it all that well last year, and he just doesn't have the arm that DJ has. So this year you go into it where you look at Benson, who was a burner. Uh, the kid from LSU was a burner. Um, I don't I, you know, I don't know what the Indiana, the Lucas kid, I don't know if he's going to be a running back or receiver, a hybrid, whatever they're going to do, but he is really fast. Um, Hakeem we know can run. Van Dravius we know can run. Destin we know can run. It's going to be a different wide receiver group, and it's going to be a lot faster. That clearly doesn't mean it's going to be better. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Mm. But it is going to be faster, and I feel like it's going to be a different element to this offense. You've got a guy that can throw it 70 yards easily, probably in his sleep. I mean, that arm is ridiculous. And then you've got guys that can really run that can take the top off the defense. Uh, Malik Benson, probably chief among them, right? Yes. Uh, but yes. he hasn't done it in a Division One football game when it really matters. He had 13 catches last year, one touchdown. Um, he did start seven games, but he wasn't an impact player. Uh, but you're right. I think and I don't listen, know if it, was, it was Isaiah Bond and yeah. you know who else was it? Had Burton? I mean, they had Burton, the kid Burton. from yeah. So it wasn't Georgia. Yeah, it wasn't like Jerry Judy and Calvin Ridley were ahead of him either. Just you know, so we know. Right. But, well, no, I, no. I think Bond is a player. I I'd probably not at the level of those two guys you just mentioned, but yeah. he's he's. He's an uh, NFL player for Burton's sure. Burton's good too. Burton, I mean, they're both solid college guys. All I'm trying to say, they're not. They weren't elite. They're not the elite yeah. Julio Joneses, right. Calvin Ridleys of the world that w that we're used to at Alabama. But I think this kid, maybe he turns into that after a year. I mean, that is, you know, and I, I'm not saying he's going to be Calvin Ridley or Julio, but maybe he turns into an NFL wide receiver, a big play guy, a second day type draft pick. Like that's the thing I keep coming back to with this team, man. And it was just, it was illuminated again on. Uh, on Monday, or sorry, on Tuesday with the guys we talked to, we have no idea. <laughs> Ferguson might be Walter Jones. He might be David Overmeyer. We have no idea. No offense, David Overmeyer. Parkview, Gwinnett, Proud, I got you. Stand You're up. just the first one that came to mind. But we have no idea what he's going to be. Clearly, I think he's going to be per – the Florida State coaches deserve the benefit of the doubt, number one. They don't go and get guys out of the portal that just can't play. But he might not be great, but he could be. Malik Benson might not be awesome, but he could be an all ACC second team or like we have no idea what his ceiling is. He could be higher than that. Like we it, it's it's going to be the, the spring and then going into August is just going to be really fun because there are so many unknowns. The kid from LSU who we talked to on Thursday, we'll talk to on Thursday. We we're supposed to get today or sorry, Tuesday. We didn't get him, but we'll get him on Thursday. That guy is a straight up wild card. He might be incredible. Yeah. Just so. don't know. Uh, but it, it, I know he's faster. They lost two guys that are going to play in the league for a good long time, I think. But th who they brought in, they might not. They're not going to be Keon Coleman, probably not going to be Johnny Wilson. Won't be as maybe maybe as productive. We don't know. They will be faster. Mm -hmm. There is an element to this wide receiver core with those guys we mentioned that just wasn't a part of the one uh, really the last two years since Pokey. Pokey mm -hmm. had speed, yeah. but they, they didn't have they didn't have a Pokey last year. Not one that was healthy anyway. Corey, do you know who had the longest reception last year for Florida State? And it's a total trick question. It's not Jordan Travis. Trey Benson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the guy, right? So it's funny. We're again on headlines, we were talking about that. Like the big play element of last year's team was number three. That was the guy. All their other big plays, save for like I think the fifty five yard crossing route that Keon Coleman had against LSU on, I believe, the first drive of the season. That was the longest touchdown a Florida State wide receiver had all year, and it was the first drive of the season. Now, the, clearly they were good enough to go undefeated, and they were very good for most of the year. 
But that was something, the big play element, the only big plays they hit, it seemed, especially the second half of the season, were, but really, honestly, the last 10 or 11 games of the season, it was all uh, Trey Benson, either hitting a big run or, like you said, a screen pass there, or a deuce kickoff return. Like, that's where the big plays came from. It was not just dialing up deep shots in the passing game, and I think that's going to be part of the offense in 24. VitaminEnergy.com, promo code is WarChampBogo. Use it, and you buy one item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. That's awesome. You know why? Uh, because it's free, and it's Florida State folks helping out Florida State folks. Florida State alums, all ACC performers at the helm of Vitamin Energy, hooking you folks up. You know, it's the world's first and only clinically tested, clinically proven energy shot to reduce brain fog, increase your focus, and obviously improve your energy levels because of the 260 milligrams of all-natural caffeine, no sugar, non-GMO, made in America. Vitamin Energy Workout Plus. How'd that work out for you the other day, Corey? It's good. It got me rolling. And I, I wish I would have used it on uh, Tuesday because I didn't get a lot of sleep on Monday night for some reason. Yeah, what was that about? I don't know. Just was tossing and turning. Couldn't couldn't get to sleep. And I really could have used it uh, for headlines. Mm. Well, we also have the eight-hour sleep. Vitamin Energy mm. helping you go to bed if that's one of your problems, too. So if you got problems getting up or slowing down, Vitamin Energy's got the fix for you. Give them a shot. Check it out. VitaminEnergy.com. Promo code Corey. War Shampoo Go. I don't know how he slept on Monday night, but uh, Irish O'Fell was busy working uh, mm. for you folks out there with an incredibly detailed breakdown of the latest saga, if you will, between Florida State and the ACC. Uh, again, Florida State has not issued uh, a decree saying that they're going to leave the conference, but obviously we can read the tea leaves and things of that nature. But they had an amended complaint which uh, rebutted some of the things that came out in the ACC's latest complaint. Uh, namely some of these things regarding potential uh, confidentiality breaches uh, in terms of the media deal to which Florida State again rebutted in their complaint saying that, hey, listen, like all the information that has to deal with our athletic department and, and these media deals, it's part of a, a state university in the state of Florida, and that is public record. So they rebutted some stuff and then they added, I guess probably the, the real headline in this core is that they added several new pieces of evidence, if you will. Not new, I guess, to the people that are initiated into just how murky this has all been, but another salvo fired in this uh, back and forth that centers on the former commissioner, his relationship with his son and Raycom and um, things that I guess some people knew, again, if they were really dialed into this, but if you weren't, uh, again, just adds another, I guess, layer of, uh, is it incompetence? Is it... Uh, irresponsibility i mean what, what sort of verb would you use is that the right word verb adjective uh, to describe the, the latest sort of uh, listing of foibles from the acc courtesy of florida state's lawsuit yeah i think it just adds more and more friction i mean it's obviously as frictious frictious if that's certainly a word i just made up Fric yeah, yeah. yeah um it's another bridge burned you're just blowing up bridges even though they're water now you're bombing them again <laughs> um when you bring up swafford and then bring up his son that's, you know, that's, I think we were already at the point of no return. Certainly Florida State fans wanted that. But now it's gotten personal. Like they, you know, they, as Ira pointed out in his story, in the first um, complaint, they, Florida State kind of put all that stuff under the umbrella of the ACC in quotes. The ACC did this in 2003. The ACC did this in 2005. In this one, the amended one, the amendment, they changed the ACC to John Swafford. Um, kind of threw a lot at his feet, and, and for the people that don't know, I hope you do. I hope you read Ira's story. I don't want to get too far into it because it's hard to explain. You actually need to go, number one, read the story on warchant.com to get a feel for it, and then also go watch the video that Ira and Asla did on Tuesday. But, um, you know, essentially, there was really no financial reason this is Florida State's argument. I think it's a pretty good one. There was no financial reason for, for the ACC to continue with Raycom. SEC Cer cut them out of the picture long yes, ago. Yes, correct. And so in 2003 or four, whenever that happened, the, AC the SEC cut out Raycom completely from the picture. We all remember Raycom growing up if you're of a certain age. Jefferson you're Pilot to me. Jefferson Pilot, Raycom. That's right. You, you remember seeing those updated scores from five hours ago that hadn't been updated, showing on your screen in the second quarter, uh, the production value, Hogwood, all the great things from, <laughs> from Raycom and, and Jefferson Pilot. Well, the SEC cut them out. Just said, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're going exclusively, I think, with the ESPN at that point. And then 
Raycom fired, I don't know, like 80% of its workforce, something crazy, some huge yeah, number. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of them wasn't John Swafford's son, which was Chad Swafford, which is a crazy name Chad. for a kid, kid with a last name Swafford. Just, you don't meet Chads now anyway, and he's in his 50s. It's really, I guess Chad Johnson's probably close to being in his 50s. It's just odd to think of a... Uh, uh, an older man who might have grandchildren soon. Oh, there's Grandpa Chad. <laughs> Just doesn't roll off the tongue. And again, I get it. I'm I'm Corey, so I have no room to talk. But um, so it, it looks very, very shady that one of the people who had just started working at Raycom was Chad Swafford. He kept his job after the SEC uh, just basically blew up Raycom. And then for whatever reason, the commissioner of the ACC at the time made it um, imperative. One of his what? Yeah, yeah, made it an imperative that the ACC keep its membership deal with Raycom, even though it didn't make sense financially, even though it wasn't great. It was, certainly wasn't in the best interest of the conference for this tier two and tier three rights to be on Raycom because they weren't getting paid what other conferences were getting paid from their tier two and th tier three rights. They stuck with Raycom, and it it absolutely looks like. Could be wrong, don't know, certainly looks like that, that the only reason they stuck with Raycom was because the commissioner's son was on a, a fast-track ladder at Raycom and then became the vice president and became like a huge big day, big wig deal at, at Raycom Sports, and that's part of the complaint that Florida State had. The point being, they uh, John Swafford kept the ACC from making real money, but more money back then, um, basically for his own family, hmm. and it doesn't look good. It also kind of, it all it all falls into the uh, I don't know, man, the cauldron, the stew of these TV deals, which also you know incorporates the the ACC network, which took forever to get off the ground. A lot of that reasoning they think for the ACC network that took too long was because they didn't want to break their deal with Raycom. They wanted to keep taking care of Raycom. All of that stuff. You know, when you, when you throw it into the pot, it looks like John Swafford was uh, not thinking about the best interests of his member institutions. He was instead thinking of the best interests of Chad, <laughs> and it, it does not look good. So that was part of the complaint, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and one of the other the big parts in there, too, is obviously the formation of what they call the Prestige Network, which is the ACC Network. Linear is what they used to call it. Now they call it, I guess, Prestige um, but the fact of the matter that apparently, according to this amended lawsuit that Florida State submitted, that John Swafford feigned was the was the word they used. Feigned, basically faked. They think, yeah, um, the urgency from ESPN apparently said that there would not be an ACC network on cable on TV like an SEC network unless the ACC went ahead and gave their grant of rights up for an even more extended yeah. period of time, which again, this was a, a bit of common knowledge. that it was a little bit of tit for tat, a little bit quid pro quo. The ACC teams are going to have to give up their grant of rights to get this linear network. That was going to help create more money, but apparently that was possibly not the case. That might've been a bit of a bluff on Swafford's part uh, just to help out, I guess, ESPN by, by getting those rights when they necessarily might've not needed them to give assurances to, to get a network up and running. And then on that note too, Corey, I thought the one that, that really stood out to me in there was the fact that I guess apparently according to, again, the great work that Ira did to go through this 50 some odd page document and give us the, the details on it. Check it out again. If you're a member of warchant.com is that apparently it costs the ACC school somewhere around four times as much to get up and running on their university campuses yeah. to be able to produce content on the ACC network, just like SEC schools do as well. So it, it's just, it, it's like this cavalcade, one thing after the other. I don't know if it's fiduciary, you know, mismanagement or just really poor decision-making. And I just wonder, Corey, is just, is it, is it just a, is this going to be a constant kind of back and forth where Florida State just keeps unloading, you know, real tangible evidence of, of mismanagement and just poor use of, of leverage, uh, do you just get to a certain point that that overwhelms like a court of law or gets something moving or will it ultimately always fall back to, well, hey, man, like you signed this contract. Like I've signed terrible contracts in my life. I think everybody listening to this probably has signed a terrible contract in their life and it was one side and it wasn't fair, but it's, you know, you sign your name on it and that's why there's lawyers out there that you, you sometimes can't get out of these things. Where do you are you any closer to seeing an end game after this latest round of uh, back and forth? 
It just – yes, because how could it, it – it, is it going to keep up like this for 13 years, 12 more years? Like the ACC in their, in their amended suit said they didn't want Florida State to have any decision-making authority. Like to be able to – you know what I mean? Like they, they're they suing them for damages. Like – and then – so it's – Which real quick, by the way, apparently to be able to do that as the ACC, to be able to have material um, lawsuit – uh, legal uh, cases that go uh, against one of your member institutions, it needs to go up for vote, and then yeah. two thirds of the institutions need to agree to it. And they did not do that in this case when they brought suit against Florida State because they were the ones that initially started the lawsuit. Florida State right. had their board of trustees meeting the next day, and then now we're here at this point, whatever, three, four weeks later. But I think the headline with all of this, man, whether we want to talk about Chad or the ESPN network or lawsuits back and forth, is this this is untenable, and it feels like it's being expedited. This doesn't it, these salvos being made publicly um, usually tend to lead to resolutions quicker. And I don't know what the resolution will be. I don't know how much money Florida State will end up having to pay. But I think what we see, especially I'm telling you, man, when you get when you bring up when you go from calling it the ACC to calling it Chad, the commissioner's son, in your amended lawsuit, you're taking direct shots like you you know what's going on now you know there's really not that there was anyway there's no turning back it has become personal and it has become you know, there's kind of dirt under the rug that you've lifted the rug and so now it's like this is this is all going to a conclusion quicker probably in the ACC's mad and they're suing back and there there will be a resolution at some point I don't see this going uh, to 2036 Florida State is clearly leading the charge they are not turning back. Uh, the ACC, the ACC is fighting for its very existence. It's not fighting. That's one thing I want people to keep in mind. It's not fighting to just keep Florida State in the league. It knows if Florida State leaves, it's the Pac-12 on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Its very existence is done. You have the North Carolina Board of Governors having these kind of thoughts too. Or what if North Carolina leaves? Are they allowed to leave with it without NC State? Like it is going on in other states. They see the writing on the wall. They are fighting for their lives. Um, and they're not trying to make it easier on their marquee program, which is weird to me if you really want to stay alive, because they know if Florida State leaves, they're done. They're done. They can get $250 million from Florida State on the way out the door. It will say it, That is a Band-Aid. It, it will not be a serious – it will be a group of five conference. If those if those teams stay, if if many of those teams stay, it is not a power conference anymore. If Florida State leaves and if Clemson leaves, and by the way, what the hell are you waiting on, Clemson? I'm sick of this, man. I brought it up. I'm just sick of it. Like, is this what going to be like? Florida State, Florida State has to, you know, storm the jungle, storm the beachhead, and then you roll in ten days later with fresh supplies. Like, thanks for doing that, guys. Like, where are you? Are you okay, Clemson? Like at this point, and I know we're only whatever we are, two months, it seems like it's been two years, two months into these lawsuits being filed or whatever it's been, maybe not even two months yet. But it sure would be nice if there was a effing peep from the people in Clemson, South Carolina, because their their whole existence is at stake too. And they're just sitting there being quiet, let Florida State do everything publicly while they do nothing or say nothing. And it really irks me because Florida State and Clemson should be lockstep. They are like-minded institutions that know how important football is, have always cared about football more than all these other institutions combined, and have, have achieved more than all these other institutions combined, with the, with, except, with the exception of Miami, who hasn't done anything in two decades. That bothers me that they're just sitting there making Florida State do all this grunt work, and they're just, what, on the beach watching. Good luck, guys. Let us know how it goes. It's like you need to get off off your rump and do something too. Or stay in this conference till twenty thirty six and how look and see how that does you. See how see how good that does you. Especially when you don't even know the transfer portal exists. <laughs> Roll to twenty thirty six in this conference making thirty million dollars less than South Carolina and Florida State and all these others, Georgia, Auburn, everybody you recruit for, and don't even use the portal. That's your your program is going to be where it was in 1995 or seven, and may not ever get back up. So it it just bothers me, right? What where are they waiting on? Yeah. Get in the fight, man. Get in the fight. And you mentioned North Carolina a little bit there ago, and you know the fact that their board of governors or board of trustees that, that overlooks, I guess, their state system of universities 
is starting to talk about this. And like when the if there's ever been like a flag, I don't know if any conference has a flagship university the way that you would like. I don't. The Big Ten isn't necessarily Ohio State. The Big Ten could easily be probably Michigan's fought over, but. And, and listen, Florida State has dominated the ACC in football, uh, even th- despite this little lull they had in, in the last decade and, and, and whatever we called what happened to Jimbo afterwards. But, man, like, the ACC is North, Car- North Carolina. Yeah. Like, the University yep. of North Carolina is its prized property. And the fact John, that... John Swafford is a UNC alum. Yeah. Is Chad? I don't know. I mean, I, I would we don't Chad. know where Chad went. I'm not sure where Chad went. I assume, but who knows? But the fact that they're kind of getting their ducks in a row for what do we need to have on the books that allows us as a state system university program to be able to exit if it comes down to that and talking about, listen, we need to, we need to come to a realization that college athletics, as we know, it has changed forever. Like, at least that seems to be some sort of substantive step moving into a direction or at least kind of tipping your hand. Meanwhile, again, Clemson, who doesn't have the prestige of Florida State or doesn't have the prestige of North Carolina, doesn't have the overall track record of success that Florida State has. So they they desperately need to be able to be well positioned and find a home. Almost They almost need to be out in front of both of those schools. I mean, Clemson needs to, to try to elbow ahead of Florida State and North Carolina because they're nowhere near as appealing as Florida State and North Carolina. Meanwhile, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, it's weird. Maybe they work in the shadows. Maybe they're like a ninja, and we'll we'll they'll do something major in the next month or two months or something. Maybe prove me they, wrong, guys. Prove me wrong. But at this point, it it really does anger me. Like there's nothing coming out of that that pro that school, and that school will get left behind. Like there's there's only one other like minded, absolutely like minded institution in the entire ACC that has carried the conference in the biggest sport, the biggest money-making sport for the last four decades, and that's Clemson and Florida State. Florida State obviously has achieved more since it joined the ACC 32 years ago now than Clemson has, but Clemson was really good, for, for and they're still good, but they were incredible there uh, from like 14 to 22 and carried the conference. back when, when the money started getting, when the ACC network started, it was Clemson and Florida State. They're a huge part of any success that the ACC has had from a national standpoint over the last half decade. But that's going to go away. And I, I just don't, like, they they can't, they, what are they going to sit in the ACC and play NC State and Wake and Duke every year and think they're going to get into a playoff? Like, you would think they would be out in front because they don't want to be left behind. Because unlike, you, you, there's no other, there's no nobody that's even close. Like, it's Clemson and Florida State for the last 20 years. It's really Clemson and Florida State. Miami hasn't done anything in the ACC, so they don't Correct. count as an ACC power. Other than those recruiting titles. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So Clemson, so Clemson and Florida State are the ACC football. They're, they, I mean, they've won – what's Florida State won? Nine, what have they won? 18 ACC championships? Clemson's won, I don't know, eight or nine since Florida State joined the conference. I don't know. It's some crazy number like that. These are the two marquee programs. But only one of them is doing the barking and the biting. The other one is just sitting there with its thumb up its butt, not saying anything as if they're okay. And I don't think they are. You know, I'm sure they want to get out with Florida State. But it's like, man, it would be nice for you to pipe up too. You, you can, why don't you start a lawsuit in your state? Why don't you do anything at all to help us expedite this so we could go in hand in hand, out the door, and hand in hand into whatever doors are open when these two schools get out of the in you know look Miami is a is a an appealing property I'm sure North Carolina is an appealing property but none of them have the marquee Miami doesn't they sell out one home game every two years none of them have the fan base or the actual ratings and marquee value that Florida State and Clemson have and it's like Clemson's just sitting there acting like they're Boston College or NC State mm. like get get on board man get on board let's hear from your board of trustees why is it only Florida State's board and Florida State's AD and Florida State's lawyers that are making news? Clemson, th- this is very, very important to Clemson too. They they cannot be in this conference until 2036. They know that, but they're not saying a peep. But again, like I said, it's only been a couple of months since the lawsuit was filed. Let's see how. Let's see where we are in what May when they do the uh, Amelia Island meetings. Those will be fun this year, by the way. The spring meetings in Amelia Island. Oh, yeah. uh, I have Florida State's even invited. <laughs> um, they might not be. They're certainly yeah, like those, have their rooms paid for. Yeah, because those are all gr- those are all like groups of coaches and administrators like working on rule changes and stuff. So yeah. they might be like, yeah, sit it out, guys. 
But I'm going to so show yeah, Pumila Island. They had, they had some chimichurri steak during lunch there that changed my life. So I'm, I'm going to try to make it out there. Oh, buddy, that's a great – that Ritz is a great – that's a great place. And, you know, for a conference that doesn't have very much money, by all means, guys, keep keep doing your spring meetings at the – you don't have to do Zoom. Who does Zoom anymore? <laughs> Spend all that money to go to the Ritz-Carlton in Amelia Island. Uh, I had an alternate theory at first. I thought, like, when they started going after Swafford, it was almost – I don't know it was either taking mercy on Jim Phillips or yeah, like almost some, being think, an about face of like, all right, well, maybe we won't go at the current administration. This it might be easier and, and more palatable and diplomatic to go after the guy that was there when all this stuff happened. Well, it, but I also think there's some truth to I think there's I, I don't disagree with what you said. I think it, it it is kind of a I mean, it's not a it's not an olive branch to Phillips, but Phillips isn't Phillips hasn't helped, but he's not the reason he was not in control of this conference when it got lapped like this. That was all on Swafford's watch. The fact that the ACC network took forever to get going was because of Swafford. Or he was certainly running the ship. He was steering the ship when that happened. So I don't you know, I'm sure he tried, but he didn't make good decisions. He didn't make good decisions. He could never get Notre Dame as a full time member. Took him forever to get the ACC network going. Phillips bringing in these last three schools, that's on him, but that's a desperation attempt. To, I don't even know what it's trying to do with Stanford, Cal, and SMU. But, yeah, man, I I, I think that it makes sense to go after Swafford. I, I do think it's, it is it is kind of a make nice with Phillips. You're not just hammering him in the lawsuit. But also the reality is this was Swafford that, that put all these schools in this mess. But the only two schools that are clearly being going to be screwed, clearly – are Florida State and Clemson. Boston College, man, if you're lucky to get $35 million a year for your TV rights to play football, just, you know, count your blessings, man. Yeah, you do not deserve it. They're not rocking yeah. any boats. Yeah, Wake's not rocking a boat. Duke's not rocking a boat. Uh, Virginia, nor, none of these schools have done anything. Florida State and Clemson are what pay the bills. They have been what have paid the bills forever, and they deserve more money, and they don't deserve to be in the ACC anymore. Only one team is at, only one program is actually trying to fight the fight right now. So again, just to, to wrap it up, you know, do we just think that the, this overwhelming amount of references and, and citations of things that went wrong, like how how does that ultimately? And I know you're not a lawyer, man, and I'm not a lawyer either, so it might be uh, unfair to even ask you this, but like, how does this end up paying off? Do we think, or is this, is it just trying to get something expedite whatever this process is? Because again, like you can. Point all this stuff out, like, hey, man, they screwed this up, they screwed that, they screwed this up, and it's like, I, I don't know, is there a certain straw that breaks a camel's back in a, in a, in a contract that it's like, all right, well, now that's 17 strikes. Now this this contract's null and void because ultimately, like, the contract is still the contract. I just I wonder how this all helps get that broken somehow, or is it just about creating... Well, I think if you could, I mean, I know I'm not a lawyer. I did watch Matlock a lot growing up. Nice. And Murder, she wrote. I guess she wasn't a lawyer, but she ended up in court a lot, it seems yeah. like. Uh, she was a fiction writer. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think the end game is either going to be, obviously it's either going to be a settlement or it's going to go to court. And I think the, the, the evidence has to prove that the that Florida State signed a contract with, with parameters and intimations that were not true. Mm. They signed it under the pretense of, we have to do this or we can't get a deal with ESPN and this conference is going to collapse. But... That if that's not true, which Florida State is alleging it isn't, that it was kind of made up, that it was feigned, as Swa as they said with Swafford, well then I think that can null and void the contract. If it was fall, if it was signed under false pretenses by the leader of the institution, then uh, you know I think maybe you, you certainly have a chance to win a case like that. Right. But I, I think Florida State would love just to have a give us a number, we'll settle and let us get out of here. Yeah, amen. Well, hey, every Clemson, you stay. You don't get to come. Yeah. You stay in the ACC. All right. Every day uh, we go around that sun out there. We're one day closer to it happening. So um, hurry up. Hurry up. Let's find a new mm. conference. I'd sure like it. Uh, MyBookie.ag, Super Bowl week. Not yet. As long as it's like super pre-Super Bowl week or whatever. But the line's finally out there. It's, I can't believe it's it. It's Pro Bowl week. It's Pro, Pro Bowl, Bowl week. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Senior Bowl week. Yeah. A shout out to Braden Fist, Johnny Wilson, Jaheim. Saw JP and Mike out there hanging out with their guys. So that's always cool to see. Somehow, San Francisco is favored by two against Kansas City. That's stinky. Like yeah. that's I, I, I'm going to have to take the Niners then. Uh, total is 47 and a half. Any initial thoughts, Corey, over at mybookie.ag? The promo code's WarChank and an instant cash deposit bonus. 
I know this isn't how football works. I get it. It's not one person versus one person. I just have a hard time thinking Patrick Mahomes is going to lose to Brock Purdy. I just I know the 49ers have weapons everywhere, uh, but I just have a hard time thinking in that moment Mahomes isn't going to get his team to win. I say that they scored zero points in the second half against the Ravens. Their their defense is very good. It'll be the best defense the by far the best defense the 49ers will have played and Purdy will have played in the in the postseason. I, I'm surprised they're the, an underdog, but. You know, maybe they win by 30 points, Aslan. Who knows? Yeah, it's crazy. Stinky line, I feel like. Uh, make your picks. Props also available over at MyBookie. That promo code WARCHANT requires a $50 minimum deposit and a rollover requirement of one time the deposit total, including your bonus for withdrawal. For full terms and conditions, visit MyBookie.ag slash about dash us. Corey, you were busy on Tuesday, man. Mm-hmm. You were transcribing all the interviews. You did headlines. Uh, and then you also hung out with... Uh, Maybe my favorite coach at Florida State. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to rank them all, but Lonnie's a one seed uh, yeah. for all time. Uh, what do you got for us? It's about 27 minutes of gold, Aslan. Mm. It's a, uh, yeah, it lo- we, we love Lonnie. She's great. Uh, she's a great coach, but she's a really good interview. She's very insightful and honest. And just kind of talk to her about uh, the season coming up. Their fan day is uh, this weekend. I think Saturday, maybe Sunday. Check your local listings. It's February 2nd, February 3rd, something like that. Um, but get on the website and find out where, where that is if you're interested. But she's February 3rd, uh, 2 p.m., Garnet and Gold scrimmage, part of Fan Day. Aslan, I told them to do it, not you. Oh, sorry. You, you know what I mean? Let them do some work for once. Right, you don't right. have to hold their hand for everything. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, she, she's awesome. Uh, and, you know, talked about her team. It's a new-look team. Obviously, they lost, they lost uh, Kat Sandercock. But they, you know, they also have Devin Flaherty back, Mudge is back, Harding is back, Enfield is back. I mean, th- they got some real players coming back, obviously. But they had, they have six new freshmen, including the number two player in the country, uh, joining the program. Uh, the other five are all ranked in like the top twenty in the country. Like this is a loaded, stacked freshman class, uh, and it's a, it's an interesting time because you got veterans, a mix of veterans, but you got a mix of freshmen that don't know the culture yet. So we talked about that and how uh, and how she just does this every year, how they're always good. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was – and it was introspective and it was philosophical. It wasn't just like, hey, who's going to replace Josie Muffley at shortstop? Mm-hmm. There's some of that, but there's also just more philosophical on how she became such a good coach and what she's looking to do each year as the roster changes. So I, I thought it was interesting. I just did, you know, you know me, Aslan. I'm I'm an incredible interviewer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, knock it out of the park. But she's she was equally good as an interviewee, and I think it was interesting stuff. And you guys should listen to it because she's an awesome coach, and this is her 16th year at Florida State, which is in, insane. But uh, good for her, and it was it's a good it's a good interview, not because of me, but because of her. She's very very insightful. Presented without commercial interruption. 27 minutes. War chant one on one. Corey Clark, Florida State softball head coach Lonnie Alameda. All right, what's up, everyone? I'm here with uh, your favorite softball coach uh, and one of the best in the country. And, and if you don't mind me saying, Lonnie, one of the, one of the best that's ever done it. Um, when you look at what your tenure and what your career has been at Florida State, I wanted to start philosophically with you on that subject. Yeah. Uh, what, were, what were you not good at when you first became a head coach? What <laughs> wow. did you have to – I'm sure that you would probably list a few things, but what were one or two things that you really had to learn and grow as you, as you kind of grew into that role? Who? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Always a joy. Um, you're incredible at what you do and such uh, passion and you. I love it. So thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize how much behind the scenes stuff, um, you know, goes on as a, a head coach of a program, essentially, like you're the CEO of softball, you know? And so, um, I had to get a lot better at just managing people and managing the game, fundraising, um, you know, future planning for the facilities, um, just growing the game itself and just uh, contract negotiations, like just so many things that are just not the X's and O of the softball field. And um, so I really had to challenge myself in that part of it and then continually challenge our staff at um, growth development. You know, I'm so lucky to have a staff that's been together too. And I've been together for a long time. And so you can really get into your program and you start to only know what you know, and you really have to challenge yourself outside that. So I've been very lucky to, for, for professional development, really challenging myself. And, you know, we all have egos if we're any, if we're even close to good. At, if we think we're good at what we do, um, and as you just said, I might be the best that's ever done it. You might be the best that's ever done it. We got a lot in common, Lonnie. So, But we, we do all have egos. But 
Was there ever a moment when you were at Florida State and you look? You've always they, you've always had good teams here, but they weren't always great. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, back when you first started, that you wondered, okay, am I elite? Like personally, looking within yourself, do I have an elite program? Am I an elite coach? What do I have to do to get there? Or did you always have kind of an, kind of an unwavering self belief? Yeah, um, I think there's always been an unwavering self belief. Uh, doesn't matter what state, uh, what weather, what environment we're in. I felt like we could win. You know, I, I felt like we um, we do it a little bit differently in the sense that um, you know we, we love teaching and we love growing the game um, for the individual and for the team, and obviously for our conference. You know, wanting to get after it. So I think that um, you know there was that that deep inside, like you know, I, I feel like I could be in Alaska and make this happen. You know, and so there, there's this belief that you can get it done. Um, but then as things start to roll, you know, and, and you get your your journey of your coaching career going and you see how the years start stacking on top of the years and then what defines you as a coach or a program. And um, the culture here has been really um, super cool to be a part of. Of course, I've, you know, the one that runs the program. And so you would say that, you know, I'm the head of the culture of the program, but it takes everyone. It takes a village. And I'm just so lucky to have a lot of people that really pour into this place. And then, you know, it, it pours itself back and um, very lucky on that side. So um, so yeah, there, there's a bit here that, um, you know, had, had big belief in it. Um, but I will say that every year you look back at it, you're like, how can we be better? And then we would, we would take on that task and be better. Uh, and that's a, a player driven and a coach driven mindset. And when you talk about, uh, being better, looking specifically at this team and culture, uh, you bring in, I think six freshmen, maybe seven, but I mean, five of the top 15 in the country, including uh, Ashton Danley, I think, who was ranked number two in the country by, by yeah. one of the services. Um, you know, they're they're very accomplished players already. Yeah. But they're joining a team with Kaylee Mudge and Harding yeah. and Kerr and mm -hmm. Devin Flaherty. Like, they're joining te a team of already ready-made, not ready-made, but established stars. Yeah. How do they, how would they fit in? Do you expect learning curves, even from the really talented players, not just on the field, but getting accustomed to being around other really good players that will hold them accountable? Yeah, yeah. Accountability, really tough leadership, you know, always really big challenges for um, teams in general and players, you know. So you look at Mudge or Ocho or Ed and Field, Devin Flaherty, you know, people that would have a voice because they've been in the experience situations. Um, but then like they've grown up too. they were freshmen, they were sophomores, you know, they're in a different role now. And I'm asking them to be uh, leaders in their actions and their words. Um, well, people were leaders for them when they were younger. So they've got to figure out how to do that. Um, so it's growing for them also. So I, I feel like every year is different. 100% uh, relying on people with the experience. They know where they're going. They know what they're getting into. Danley has no idea. She's excited about it. I just saw her this morning coming out of the training room. Super excited about what's ahead of her no idea where she's going next year you come back as a sophomore you're like oh, i i now know why you know off-season training is really important you know i now know why drinking water is really important you know and um they have never lived a full 60 game season maybe 70 game season and so um so those little nuggets come in when you start to you know get to your returning players but we are a different team we're going to rely on some freshmen uh this year i'm really excited they will be different you know, those freshmen will be different february March, April, they're going to be different as they grow along. And a lot of that's because those upperclassmen put their arms around them and say, hey, man, I know what you're feeling. I've been there and let me help you through it. Does this, do you remember, is, had there been another season quite like this where you have, like we talked about, you have some established veterans, a lot of them actually, yes. uh, Haley, you have, you have players that have accomplished a lot and hit home runs in, in Oklahoma city, mm -hmm. but yeah. I feel like there's some spots there to be won. Yeah. And you have some hungry freshmen. Um, do you think you just mentioned it? Do you think this freshman class will will have to contribute quite a yeah. bit for this season? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, definitely going to have to um, contribute. And when I say contribute, um, just being present. I, I think if I if we could do a really good job of keeping them present, um, so they can learn throughout. You know, by the end of February, you know, if our heads above water and we're present and we feel the highs and lows and we feel the big TV games and we feel those pressures and we feel the Wednesday night games, we feel the um, load on a Monday and after playing four days in a row, like, you know, how to get yourself back. If you can be present and feel all that, you can really have a successful second half of the season. Um, if you get completely overwhelmed and you just can't be present for it and you don't know how to get through it. So we will, you know, definitely rely on them big, but it is our jobs as coaches and upperclassmen to make sure that we, 
we get them through it because they can contribute. Torres is going to be great at shortstop position. You know, Andy Potter came in as a transfer, has been there before, but new to our program and, you know, can play the middle and field. Jason E. Beecham, you know, flat out swings it. She's going to play some third. You know, you got Ocho over there, but she's helping her out. We've got kids also graduating, you know, so we've got to maintain the fact that you're going to experience for this season, but what are we getting next season too? So we got to pour into that part of it also. And then, you know, I think the pitching staff in general, we've got some returners. Um, they just haven't had tons of innings. So they know the system. They just haven't been there. And then some rookies coming in, they're going to go through it and, and figure it out. So super exciting on the coaching side. Um, we just have to manage the expectation side. There's an expectation and a standard here in the program. And we want that. And that these kids want that when they come into it. But you have to work on the execution daily and not let the expectation outweigh the being present in the moment to execute what I need to do right now. Well, and that, that's kind of what I was going to ask, Lonnie. You, you've got this program to a point where obviously you made it to the, the championship series last year. You've won national championships. You're a fixture in Oklahoma City. How do you get veterans? Like, it's one thing for freshmen, but veterans like Devin and Kaylee, both Kayleys, to keep their feet on the ground and not look to yeah. May. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, the, the, you don't get to May where you want to be unless you're doing what you need to do in January and February. But they're so veteran. They've been through this before. Like, how do you keep them, you know, do you know what I'm asking? Like, oh, how yeah. do you keep them from wanting to look ahead and yeah. jump ahead to those, to those series and those games? Yeah, I think we do a really good job of um, just playing in the moment, you know, and Ellie Cooper, our player performance coach, um, who's been in their shoes before, can sit and speak uh, at a mental session game, you know, our mental game session with us and talk about like, what are you feeling right now? And, you know, we just had a session yesterday where, you know, Ocha, like, what do you need to optimally perform? What do you need to be thinking? What do you need to be doing? And so sharing their experiences. And I'll tell you, last season, it was, you know, week by week. It wasn't, we know, we always have a goal of being in Oklahoma City, but there is a process to get there. And our kids last year had to earn that process. So now they have respect for that process to turn around and say, it's a new team. We're earning the process to hopefully give us the opportunity to make the run. And so I think we're really grounded in that. So it's not come in, we're going to the World Series. It's come in, let's earn it, earn it daily. Let's go through this. And then if we get the chance, you know, we can make a run. So it, it's very grounded in that sense. Do you think the influx of freshmen having, I guess, seven new players on this team, seven or eight, whatever it is, like almost a third of the roster, or almost 40% of the roster helps in that regard? Yeah. Like they've never played Florida. Yeah. You know, they've never played a, a road series in the ACC like that, yeah. that they're going to be doing all this stuff for the first time, which might keep your veterans. Not that you'd have a problem with that anyway, but keep them in the moment, too, because they're going through it with their teammates. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, sometimes it's as a freshman, you don't know what's ahead of you. That's that could be just pure joy. You're just going out and playing a softball game. Whereas a returner, right. you know what's ahead of you. So like you have these expectations, you know, so there is a good balance to both. Um, you know, and, and I think that goes back to us as a coaching staff, like we'll get moments where like, oh, we can see they're nervous. They should be nervous. Let them enjoy this moment because they have earned this nervousness. Right. And then how do we handle it? So afterwards we can debrief it. So the next time we get to a stage of expectation versus execution, we have something to fall back on. It's also hard as hell to get to Oklahoma city, like really hard. hard. Like <laughs> you guys were an awesome team last year and you kind of needed a no hitter from your star pitcher to get to Oklahoma City. Yeah. And then you were basically, I don't know, a great catch in center field away from at least being in a game three. And that, that's how the the, the 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 margins are so narrow Yeah, that it's almost like you have to enjoy. There's no guarantee. I mean, you lived that two years ago. There's yeah. no guarantee that no matter what you do during the season, you're going to get to Oklahoma City and win it. So appreciate yeah. and enjoy the journey. Is that, yeah. a, is that a message you guys kind of tell them a lot? Yeah, for sure. You know, I was watching the Lions Niners game the other day and it's like, it's crazy how in games when you get to like the last part of your season, crazy things happen, you know, ball off the right. mask and the guy picks it up and runs it in. Right. And it's like, right. it's like those things happen in all sports, you know? So sometimes you got to tip your cap and be like, man, that's a game of softball. And then there's times where like, I expect myself fundamentally to be here. And then there's times like crazy things happen, you know? And it's like, I think we appreciate all of it, you know, and it's like if you go out there and you just try to just grind it out all the time and it is, I don't think people realize we're playing 56 games. When you make a run at 70 games in three months, like we are going, we are going Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're going to play on a Wednesday and a Thursday and to go again, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it is the, the challenge part of it is pretty incredible in the baseball softball sport, you know? And so we don't get a lot of time to prep. You just got to rely on the fact that you can play the game. 
So there's things we got to high five and love up. And then there's things we just got to laugh off. And that's the way it is. So we just got to keep balancing that because it is a long journey. And, uh, you know, you really got to enjoy that part of the journey. When you when you look at this season, obviously we just talked about or I did about cat. Um, that's a those are enormous shoes to fill. One of yeah. the best that's ever done it. Um, I guess talk and then Muffley at shortstop. Obviously, one of the best defensive players, it, it, probably in ACC history. I would think she was just outrageous. Yeah. Where do you look? Where do you see yourself right now as a team? Do you do you even have a defined like this is going to be our number one pitcher? This is going to be our starting shortstop. Would you even know that in late January, early February? Um, I mean, I think we have an idea. Um, but you know, again, like you start playing the games and they'll figure it out. So by the end of February, we're gonna have a really good idea, and that's usually how we go. We get to the end of February and um, we're like, man, we really like this combination of pitching staff. We really like this combination of infield or we like this lineup part of hitting, you know, or when we're facing a good rise ball kid, we like this lineup, you know. So we, we really try things out a lot in the fall and in, in February to give us a good feeling as we jump into the ACC season. So, yeah, so have some ideas, but things will definitely hit us and, and be able to make some changes when we get to end of February. And I, I've asked you this before, but I think there's a lot of reasons that your program stands out. The way you guys play defense uh, is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, you guys have been very good at that for a long time. And we hear in every sport, coaches preach how much defense matters. They preach it, the fundamentals. That's what they're focusing on. And then you watch that team play and you're like, do you guys even practice? Yeah. But you, I've watched you guys practice. I know how you do it. Um, have have these newcomers, along with the veterans, fit right into what you're trying to build uh, defensively? Because I think I might be wrong. I might be speaking out of turn. I think that's one of the backbones of your program is what you do defensively. Yeah, I think it's a the mindset is pitching and defense working together. So instead of just pitchers and defense and hitters, it's pitching and defense and then it's base running and hitting. Right. So like, how do you work together? So uh, people running on base and the hitter, you guys are one. If I have a shortstop and a pitcher, we're one, right? So we're really making sure that we have a good idea of what I do when I'm trying to do in the circle, which is going to now, you know, Megan King got to the point where she was like throwing a pitch saying, Callie Herod, here you go. You know, like it got so in sync, but that takes time and that takes a, a lot of opportunity. And so right now in the beginning, we might be a little like off cue because we have new pitchers that we really don't know what the situation is going to hold for them. The moment in a game, you know, feeling that like Danley's going to be a freshman in a game, feeling it. And then over time, we have to figure out what Daniel Danley gives us, right? And then she starts to get that feel of like, oh, now I know what I'm good at. Now we're going to work together, you know, peeps behind me. And so uh, I, I think that's uh, something gets earned, you know, through the month of February. And we talk about it a lot. And you mentioned Danley, so I'm going to bring it back to her real quick. She's the one that was, I think, like we talked about, ranked number two in the country. Um, she's a pitcher, but she also hit. Yeah. Is she going to hit for you guys? Yeah. yeah. Have you had – I have you had – a lot of pitchers that were also hitters for you over the um, years? You know, I think it's kind of changing. I mean, Mac Leonard would have been the two-way player for us last sure. year. He came in a lot, hit and played some first base. And, you know, it's funny, the last couple of camps, it's starting to change again. All the pitchers coming in are hitting and playing positions. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pitchers out there that we've seen be able to do both. And we have, some of the pitchers are very athletic. Cat was very athletic. She could play, um, you know, some defense. She could hit. She could swing it. She just chose to really focus on the pitching side of it. So, um, So I think that, you know, it may change a little bit as we go along here and some pitchers may hit, which is nice. It's nice to have someone to be able to bring in and out of the game or in and out of situations. But you also got to manage their load and make sure that their bodies can handle it. Um, Ashton's a pretty smooth delivery, so she's very efficient. So that allows her the ability to be able to do both. And then just I, I just don't want to fly past her because she was so awesome. Um, it's going to be the first time in, what, five years since you didn't have Cat? Yeah. <laughs> pitching for you? Yeah. As a coach, and we just talked about this before we started, this is your 16th or 17th year. I think it's your 16th. That's what the bio said anyway, which is crazy. I can't yeah. believe it's been 16 years. Yeah. Um, this is this is a part of the job. You, you get to know these these players. You, you watch them grow up. You watch them become awesome. Yeah. And then they leave you. Yeah. Um, but what she seems to be a little, one of those extra special ones that have come through this program. Yeah. Was it weird the first day of practice and her not being there? Like just I, I feel like that would have been a – like that's like a warm blanket you've had yeah. <laughs> to wrap yourself in over the last four years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you definitely get used to some players and anchoring positions. I would say Jesse Warren was one of them, you know, sure. and then um, obviously Sid Cheryl, like they just anchor their position so well, cat for sure um, in the circle. But 
I also, you know, Kat was really good last year at like, you know, I, I need to make sure I communicate with McKenna and I communicate with Allison and Emma, like, you know, I'm changing, I'm handing you the ball and you go to the next group and I've done all I can for this program. And I came here to, you know, go pro and do some things later. And she earned all that. So she gave us everything possible at Florida state. And then she was ready to go on and put it all to the test at another level. And so there was really good closure uh, at the end of the season last year. And so not that, you know, my heart doesn't miss her for sure, but now it's opportunities for other people to step up. So what she poured into them and what I'm pouring into them is their chance now. And Megan King did that to her and Jessica Burroughs did that to Megan King, you know? So it's like, there's been prominent pitchers throughout here that have been like, Hey, here's the torch, you know, take care of the program. And so, um, so yes, you know, professionally, if I was a pro coach, you know, you're keeping them around forever and you're mm. doing exactly what they need to do, but you're in college and the opportunity is that four years with them and to grow them the best you can. And then the, them realize how special it's been, their journey, their experience, and they're giving back because now someone else is, is taking it on. So, um, so she's been back here and, you know, we keep in touch quite a bit. Um, but you know, she was tremendous, but now she is so ready for the next level. She's pitching in Japan. She loves it. She's traveling the world. She loves it. It's, it's just really cool to see. Lonnie, and I, and I wanted to ask you as we get as we wrap this thing up, and I and I hate this question because I feel like I've asked it to you for five years in a row about the growth of this game, yeah, in the in the popularity of your team in particular in this city, but I don't want to ever dismiss it as in in not acknowledge that I have a pretty good feeling that if Kaylee Mudge and Harding and Michaela, in fact, I've seen Michaela walk into restaurants, yeah. <laughs> and you would think she's Jordan Travis. Yeah. Like people rush up. Like, I can't imagine what that's like for you. And I'm going to phrase it and frame it like I have the last five times I've asked yeah. you this question <laughs> to see the popularity of this sport in the popularity of these players becoming like legitimate stars on campus and stars in the country. Um, that has to just talk about a war something that warms you. Yeah, that's just got to be really, really neat. And it keeps growing. It yeah. keeps it, it doesn't stop. It hasn't plateaued. You look at the women's basketball national championship game with Iowa and LSU. I think it outdrew the men's game yeah. or got close to it. I just feel like this is a it's been a long time coming, but it's almost like a reckoning when it comes to women's sports, especially college sports. It yeah. hasn't hit the pro sports yet, but college sports, women's college sports has never been more popular. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a little switch in um, how people play the game. So I think females in general just play for such joy and their teammates. That's just the, the culture of it, right? Um, so, and there's a societal side that likes to just watch things for the fun of it. Like people like feel good watching people smiling and having fun in big pressure moments, right? Where the male game can get so dominating and, it, you know, it's it's a, you can't smile. You can't high five things like, you know, right. sometimes, but I've also now seen a little switch. You see MLB, you know, they're in there, they're doing their uh, home run little trots yeah. in their dugouts or high five. They're trying to have fun. The whole thing in MLB is let the boys play, you know, like they're trying to find that fun, not so macho situation. Um, you know, I see the end zone touchdown dances and the stuff. So it's like, we're morphing a little bit into, we want to have, everyone wants to have fun. You're, you're training at a high, high level, softball, basketball, like, a lot of these girls growing up now had their moms playing in college. My mom wasn't allowed to play in college. So title nine's really kicking in with the opportunity. Like these kids are growing up on a dinner table that mom and dad both played in college and they're telling their stories. So the daughters are hearing that where before all they heard was dads talking about their stories. Right. So now we're starting to get an equal like respect. We can play at a high level. We're working at a high level, we're being trained at a high level. So the game is fun to watch and then the girls are having fun doing it, you know? And so I think the man, the men's game is starting to come a little bit more to like, it can be fun. It doesn't always have to be so, you know, me versus you. And I have to grimace all the time, you know? So it's, it's fun. So I appreciate that side of it. I think people come to the park, they enjoy it. They have a good time. They get to know the players. They feel very, you know, there's a lot of aunts, uncles and grandmas and grandpas out here, right? They're just, they don't, may not know the players, but they know the players. It, it's just, a, right. it's a really connected uh, sport. So we take pride in that. We want to have people feel good about it. And they want I want them to walk away feeling the pride of being connected to our program because we play the game right. We play with heart. It may not be about the wins and losses, but we really enjoy watching them do their thing. And before I let you go, uh, two quick questions. First off, what was it like to watch what the soccer team did this year? You share yeah. a complex with them. Um, I'm hoping to get Brian on the show uh, at some point in the next yeah. week or two. Uh, I, I, you could make an argument that was one of the best soccer teams in college 
history. I mean, it no. was ridiculous what they did. Yeah. What is that like? Just the excellence that's in that building. And and I don't, I know, I don't know if it's competitive. I'm sure it's not. You're rooting for each other. Yeah. But it's kind of cool that you keep you guys keep adding trophies next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought for a fundraising thing, we could sell the water here, right, for a while because there was something <laughs> sure. in the pipes here that someone needed and, you know, it'd be a good fundraising event. But no, we're big fans of Penske. I was a big, you know, I'm Coach Gregorian was great to us. Um, we are housemates. It's crazy how much we don't mingle. We get in our mm. world and we get after it. So I asked uh, BP to come out and talk to our team the other day. And right. uh, he was spot on with a little pregame speech for a pre practice speech for us. And, um, you know, just, just feeling the situation that he got into um mark was incredible strategic human like coaching they were so strategic now the change of the guard bp's a little bit more player led uh, music's played out there there's a different vibe but both of them were incredible what they did for the game of soccer over there and so um you know when he spoke to our team he is just you know he is about the players taking ownership and uh, getting after it and that was just really cool to hear you know a lot of times coaches we don't get to hear like their their talks we're not in the room a lot and so he is, he's incredible. So I hope you get him on because he's inspiring. And um, yeah, our whole team's locked in. I can't tell you, I don't know how many games our team, you know, they were all together watching their game, supporting them. They, they love watching that soccer team play. And the reason that this was my last one, the reason we didn't have him on the week after he won the national championship was because the football team got kept out of the postseason, out of the playoffs. Yeah. And I just wanted your perspective as a competitor, as an elite coach that has coached championship caliber teams and a national championship team. What was your thought w w when you saw that? Because the beauty about softball, I know there's a selection process. Yeah. But, you know, maybe the 65th team in the country doesn't make it. Yeah. But they probably had 22 losses. Yeah. A team that had zero losses. What was that like as a coach and a competitive coach that appreciates winning when maybe overcoming obstacles to win, what yeah. was that like to see uh, for yeah. one of your fellow coaches? Yeah. I mean, heartbroken. I texted Norvell right away. I think our whole team was all over social media right away because we, um, we live it here. You know, the climb is not just for the football team. It's for everyone. I, I think their values and, and standards of how they do things, you know, our, our players are, are with the players. Athletes are hanging around with athletes all the time. Right. So, they felt that we felt that um, we are very family driven here in Tallahassee, you know, at Florida State. And so we, we definitely felt that part of it. We as a program are very team oriented, too. And you could tell that team played for each other. So to take away that uh, part of the game and say that team doesn't matter and like right. the eye test and the skills matter, then you're taking away a huge element of what a lot of people in the country and the world cheer for is, you know, teams playing team sport. And uh, so that, that really hit home. And I know it was really tough for him, but you know, he's a great leader and he turned it around. And um, I feel like, you know, these kids will go on and, and be very, it's all experiences, right. And how we sure. respond to the experiences. And so um, they're great that they, I'm sure they're grateful for the the journey they had. They feel snubbed at the end, but it is life and you move forward and the lessons you learned. And, and I know Norvell definitely uh, sent that message, but um, it all sticks in our craw a little bit. <laughs> well, he did end up taking half the Alabama team out of the portal after that happened. Yeah. So he, he, he did his work after the, after yeah. that snub. So you guys have fan day this weekend. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then the season starts, what, February 16th? Eighth. Is that right? Eighth. We're here. Um, we have um, um, Texas Tech, which would be kind of fun. Coach Snyder, who coached with us for many years. Yeah. Ago, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Back. Yeah. And one of our former coaches, um, Bryce DeCouve, Morgan Claveman. Pedro was a manager. Morgan played here. They're all on yeah. staff. They're coming back. So it's going to be a reunion there. And Charlotte's coming in and playing fam. So it's going to be a great weekend. Um, yeah, fan day. It's been incredible. We started fan day just to, one, um, you know, get our players, especially our freshmen, a little bit of environment of the people that support them. So uh, a mingle time, a sign autographs time, play in front of everybody. So to, it's a really good time to celebrate the opening season uh, of softball. So we've tried to figure out fan day of how to educate, you know, the things that we're doing on the field and when to cheer and when to create a, a home environment. Right. And um, I know a lot of people have complimented our fans on how crazy this place is. And I think that's because they, they continue to come and be a part of growing and raising our seasons and our games. So, so fan day will be fun. It's just a, you know, an hour and 45 minute scrimmage. And then we head over to our first pitch party. And that's part of a one kicking off the season two fundraising because everyone's got to do that. So it's fan raising, fundraising, you know, however we want to put it. Right, but, uh, right. A big auction. Um, last year, a lot of cool stuff that we had from the World Series sign. So all, you know, authentic pieces. So it, it's a really fun time for us. 
Lottie, you're the best. You know that. You know how much I care for you in this program. It's really fun to watch how good you guys are every year. It's just a constant. It's a constant in all our lives that FSU softball is good. I know. No pressure, though. I know, right? That <laughs> no expectation <pressure>. execution, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But thank you very much, and we will catch up later down the road. Sounds amazing, Corey. Thank you so much. So, Corey, are we going to get a return of Tuesdays with Corey? I mean, the wildly popular franchise. Can we get it, please? You talking about a, just me doing interview podcasts? Yeah, you know. Then we can put if on you this can book them. If you book them, I'll ah, do it. Yeah, if you yeah. and Tom, like Tom, booked that one for me, and yeah. Ben produced it. So, and I feel like I'm the talent, right? Right. right. So I feel like everybody else behind the scenes should be setting up guests for me one at a time at a time, and I'll just knock them down. But if I have to set up the guests, uh, I can tell you just from past experiences, it probably won't happen. Yeah. You figure it's a really easy thing. It sounds easy to book interviews. Um, yeah. For some reason, it's not. For some but Pinsky, reason, we need to get on Pinsky. I want to get Brian Pinsky on next week if we can. Okay. I'll see, I'll see what we can do. See what we can do. All right. That's a wrap for us. Uh, check out warchant.com, though. Plenty of information over there regarding the newcomers, uh, regarding, regarding recruiting, and also softball and the latest in the ACC and Florida State's lawsuit. We got you covered over at warchant.com. Subscribe, everybody. It's worth it. FR, FR. I-Y-K-Y-K. Hmm. That's a wrap. Jeff Cameron Show, 1 to 3 o'clock. Thanks to Coach Alameda for hopping on with Corey. And for Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you for listening to Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.